Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be continuing our series, uh, kind of plunging the depths of the fear of the Psalms. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 27. And basically it's a psalm to calm all fears. Psalm 27. It's one of my favourite psalms. And if you would like to turn in your Bibles to page 561, page 561, we're going to be looking at the whole psalm in a few moments we've got together. Page 561. And it goes like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in the temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Before we get into this psalm, let's just spend a moment praying together. I just invite you in this moment just to think, Lord Jesus, what would it be for me today to hear a, a custom tailor-made talk? What situation am I facing that if I heard a message today, it would speak right into my heart? And Holy Spirit, you know that situation, I don't. And I just invite you now, Lord, for me to be your transparent vessel, just to share what you've put on my heart, to speak to your people, that this won't just be another sermon, Lord, but there will be lives changed today. Would your spirit, would your presence just be with us now, Lord Jesus, as we get into this text. And we ask this for your holy name's sake. Amen. Does anyone here ever think you're the only person who thinks the thoughts that you do? I just want to share with you for a moment, kind of, I took a step back this morning and kind of recorded the transcript, if you like, of my internal dialogue that played between 6 a.m. this morning and being here with you now. 6 a.m., the alarm goes off, feeling a bit groggy, go to snooze, ooh, what if I snooze? I, I might get up late and, um, and I, I might miss getting here in time for the service. Once I get over that, I get out of bed, have a quiet time, a little bit more rushed than usual, and I start to panic. Oh Lord, what if, what if my sermon doesn't speak to people the way I thought it would because my quiet time hasn't been long enough? After all, you know what they say, those who run away from God in the morning scarce find him throughout the rest of the day. 
Then when I get over that, I open my wardrobe and see I haven't ironed a shirt. So I have a bit of a Bridget Jones moment, and I start to think, oh no, they're going to think, they're only going to think I've only got one pair of clothes because I wore this shirt last time I preached. Anyway, got over that, got over that, went to have some breakfast, looked over my sermon notes and thought, oh, this doesn't make sense, this just doesn't make sense. What if, uh, what if, what if it doesn't communicate very well, or at least what if it communicates well, but it doesn't speak to anyone after all? Let's say there are about 500 people here, 30 minute sermon, that's about 250 hours that have been wasted. And so by the time I get out the door, I have in my head been spinning this perpetual wheel of what if, what if, what if scenarios. And to map this onto an illustration, if I can indulge just a little bit further, what you'll see here, some of you might remember these things, it's a thing called a vinyl record player. <laughs> and what I've learned like with any record, any form of audio, sometimes a record can get scratched. And frustratingly, when a record gets scratched, the same phrase loops round over and over again. And what I realise is the devil, aka the enemy, whatever you want to call it, he can create scratches in my spirit to make me play this track over and over again. And you know, fear has one track. Fear has one track that plays over and over again, and it's this track called What If. <laughs> if I was to connect, to connect your brain stems up to this screen, I'm sure there'd be copious amounts of what if scenarios playing out in your brain. Perhaps during the worship today, you were playing out some what if scenarios. Perhaps as I'm speaking now, you're worrying about tomorrow. All these what if scenarios. What if I lose my job? What if I keep my job? What if I stay single the rest of my life? What if I stay married the rest of my life? <laughs> what if I never have children? What if my health gets worse? What if my friends never come to know Christ? What if, what if, what if? And if I can take this illustration a little bit further, we all have scratches and indentions underneath our spirit that create this perpetual, endless, ongoing phrase, what if, what if, what if? And you know what I've learned? If I let the devil let me, I will put this track on time and time again, and I won't be able to break it. But what I've realized is fear gets a lot more weight and plays its greatest hit, what if, when I put more weight on my what if rather than what God said and to who he is. But what we're going to see in this psalm today is somehow David managed to face his fear by doing two things. And it's the title of my sermon today, Fix Your Focus and Feed Your Faith. Fix Your Focus and feed your faith. You see, David wasn't just facing some what-if scenarios. David was facing some very real trouble and hardship in his life. If you look down at the text from verses 1 to 3, we have all sorts of imagery and language. We can, I've been kind of crashing the context around with various scholars, and no one can really specifically say what David is going through. But what we do know is he's in a war zone. He's being surrounded on every side. Three times we hear fear and afraid. It's a great language. It's full of, it's laced in military language. And you know why I like that? Not just because it tells us that David's in a war zone, but it shows us that we are in a battle between faith and fear in our lives. Walter Brueggemann, kind of the best Old Testament scholar, I would say, said of this passage, this passage epitomizes the battle in the Christian life, the choice between faith or fear. So the question I want to answer today is how can David say at the end of verse 3, if you look down in your Bibles, we pull out this phrase, though war break out against me, I will be confident of this. In the Hebrew, it doesn't say that. It says, I am confident. So how do we turn our what-if scenarios into knowing that God's going to come through for us to be like David. Because I want you to look down at the text for a moment and we're going to just look at some of the words. I'm just going to pull out a few words. So David said, the Lord is my light. Therefore, that means his guide. The Lord is my salvation. That means his deliverer. 
Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In the message version, it says, despite the fact I have an enemy against me, I'm as calm as a baby. How on earth do we get here? This isn't a light little thing for David. War is breaking out against him, but he manages to turn his what if into worship. The one secret, the secret behind David's confidence in God is found in verse 4. Let's read it. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I'm going to be honest with you. I feel incredibly uncomfortable when I first read that. Why? One thing I ask, constantly in our lives, we're being told you must do this one thing. Be it with making sure your health's okay, something your boss wants you to do at work, a demand from a colleague or a friend. I'm constantly being told, one thing you must do, one thing you must do. So when I read this, if I'm honest, well, at first glance, I, I kind of recoiled inside and thought, whoa, we're doing people, we're active people, but David learned to live in the proximity of the presence of the Lord. Why don't we do it? It was quite obvious. You know the story, go back to, Gen uh, to Genesis chapter 3. We were created for this beautiful utopia, this intimacy with God in the Garden of Eden, to walk step in step. We read from Genesis 1 in the ESV, there's rhythm, there's pace. We're created to be side by side with God. God said it was good, God said it was good, God said it was good. There's rhythm, there's pace, there's logic. And then suddenly what we see at the end of chapter 3 is Adam and Eve are sowing fig leaves together. Number one, chafing. But not only that, they're scared. Intimacy has been broken, and ever since, man and woman has been trying to get their groove back. A groove, as musicians will know, is just the sweet spot where you could play for hours and hours, and somehow David had found this sweet spot. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. But the other reason why this is difficult for us to do is because we live by pressures rather than priorities. We get distracted. This all sounds a little bit passive to me. Just gazing on the beauty of the Lord, it also sounds a bit emotional. I'm kind of, I want to take a bit of a step back. But David was a militant warrior, a king, a soldier. So why didn't he get his strategy and his army together? What was it about getting in the presence of God that was better than what we think he should have done? And I think it's because he realised the most fruitful endeavours always come out of faithfully entering God's presence. Innovation will always flow from the revelation of who he is. But not only that, we see that being in God's presence gave him shelter. It gave him confidence. It gave him security. But while I'm addressing the elephant in the room, let, let's be honest, there are many reasons why we don't enter God's presence. We have, as Dave mentioned last week when he preached, we have different measuring sticks. We're defined by other people and other things. Let me start with comparison. You compare yourself to someone else who you think is doing better than you, and you, get conde you feel condemned, don't you? You compare yourself to someone you think you're doing better than them, and you get cocky. And then the worst of all is when we compare ourselves to someone else that we think we're on the same level as, and we get complacent, and we end up in this cave of comparison. But David, one thing I seek, to enter the beauty of the Lord. Every other psalm says the beauty of his holiness. For everything in our flesh doesn't want to do it. I've got a, a, a modern contemporary illustration to show this. Do you mind just getting my Twitter feed up on the screen, please? That's my Twitter feed. Now, the other day, I was looking after a gentleman who has quite a few Twitter followers, quite a lot of them, and he said to me a few months ago, well, I don't use Twitter anymore. And then I saw him there by his desk playing on his Twitter account. And, you know, I didn't want to, you know, be disrespectful, but I did say to him, uh, I thought he didn't go on Twitter. And he's there on his phone. He goes, I don't. And I go, you're on it now. He goes, no, 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 I just stay at home. I was like, what? For one, we're in Camber Sands and in a chalet. And two, I can see you on it right now. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. You see, I stay at home. You see, I don't like Twitter because I get a lot of criticism. People don't like my doctrines. I get lots of people speaking at me and it distracts me from my purpose. So what I do is I always stay at home. 
top left button, home. He says, you see, the thing is, Rob, when I'm at home, I can only see the feed of the people that I've chosen to follow. I can only see the people that I want to give input into my life. And it's through that I get fed, I get knowledge. You see, the danger comes when that little bell starts ringing called notifications. And people start saying all kinds of things to me. You see, as long as I don't click on the notifications, as long as I stay at home, seeing the people that I know will feed into my life, that's when I'm safe. And similarly, I think it's a great contemporary example of what happens with David in this psalm. One thing I will seek, to stay in the house, to stay at home, when it's very easy for, for fear and things to get in the way and distract us, for criticism, for, for all sorts of things to happen, he stays at home and he makes sure he's fed by the word and he's sheltered and he's protected. He doesn't listen to all the conflicting views and voices going on in and around him. He fixed his focus on the beauty of the Lord, gazing at the beauty of his holiness. But the second thing that happens is praise lift his perspective. Look at verse 6 with me, if you would. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. You see, I always used to think, and I think this is the big reason why many of us don't enter God's presence, is because we often think going into God's presence is going to fix our problems. But maybe, just maybe, as David learned, going into God's presence isn't to fix our problems it's to change our perspective to view our problems in a different way. Let's be honest, there are distractions, there's discouragement, but if we're really honest, there's doubt. Entering into God's presence for, for David was a daily thing. But for us, we struggle. It's the flesh. Brother Lawrence, you know the man who wrote the, the axiom, practicing the presence of God, said your flesh will do everything it can to go against spending time with God. But that's who we're meant to be. St. Augustine said our hearts long for God and they will only be fulfilled once we find our fulfillment in him. So he fixed his focus. But I know what some of you skeptics might be thinking right now. That was David. He's like the superhero in the Hall of Fame, as Hebrews talks about it. He was one of a kind. But what's amazing about this psalm is verses 7 to 14, the tone changes a little bit. Suddenly the confidence of the Lord being his stronghold and his salvation of singing with shouts of joy suddenly change and the tone shifts a little bit. Look down at the word with me, if you would. If we look at verse 7, uh, hear my voice when I call, Lord, be merciful to me. My heart says, seek your face. Don't hide your face from me. See, suddenly, we see David isn't as confident, which dispels the myth that God only uses people who don't have any fear. As the closer you get to people, the most likely thing is they stepped out in faith despite their fear. You see, they fed their faith. So often we feed our fears. But when we feed our faith, uh, sorry, when we feed our fears, our faith is malnourished and our courage just doesn't work. But David in verse 8 says, I will seek my face. And you know what he did? He shifted his devotion. See, when we're fearful, it shows what we're devoted to. But when we fix our focus away from fear and onto faith, our devotion changes and our emotion actually follows that. And we can go out and do all the things that God wants us to do. And I want to share two illustrations from my own life, just so you know that I'm kind of serving what I've tasted for myself, if you like, that I am fearful as well. And I wanted to share these illustrations, and I shared the thought of doing these with a good friend, and he goes to me, Ooh, Rob, are you sure you want to share these? Lots of people. You know there are two kinds of people, those who think with their head, those who think with their heart. I'd like to think there are some people in the middle. But I said, ah, your reaction has just confirmed that I'm going to accomplish exactly what I seek to achieve by sharing these illustrations. Because sometimes between the pulpit and the pew, from one side of the pew to the other, we think we're the only ones going through stuff. 
We think we're the only ones with the internal transcript, the internal dialogue, saying what if, what if, what if, what if. But I just want to share with you two things, an everyday example that I deal with, and the biggest struggle, the biggest what if I've had to deal with to date in my life. Number one, my biggest fear is public speaking. You do not want to be in my house the night before I'm preaching a sermon. So scared, so fearful, I get up. But what I've just started to learn is when you get into the presence of God, it's his power and the more pressure there is, the more power comes from him. Here's a silly illustration. It's like having a little water gun, a little bit of, power, a little bit of pressure, you get a bit of power. But if I got the super soaker out, <laughs> you'd know it. And the second, my biggest fear to date, getting married. See, Bernadette and I broke up for four days. You know, and I had a Bridget Jones moment. I was on my bed kind of, you know, thinking, Lord, how did we get to this? And it was fear. I had some scratches in my spirit from past experiences, things not modelled brilliantly, just, just more doubts about myself, really. And I was there going, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then I felt the Lord, I sensed the Lord speak to me. And this is what I want to share with you today. Faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith is the presence of Christ, which is greater than any fear that you will ever face. You've got to feed your faith. You've got to fix your focus. David was scared. David was anxious. He had people up against him. Even his mother and father, it says in verse 10, had forsaken him. Yet somehow he could say, I remain confident. I am confident of this. So yes, he sought the Lord. That's all he wanted to do. Seek the Lord. That's very ambitious. We want to do that. I would encourage us today. That would be the one thing we seek. But he was still scared. You see, we think fear is just going to evaporate, but we need to evict fear with our faith. And that's what we see happened with David. If you look down with me, verse 11, teach me your ways. That word teach me literally from the Torah. Why is that important? I hear you, you cry. Well, basically, there's a, there's a rabbinic tradition that believed that David, when he went to bed every night, put his harp on his, right next to his window and at midnight the west wind, the northern window would open and the wind would suddenly start making the harp sing. It was basically like an ancient alarm clock. And David would wake up at midnight and study the Torah from 12 o'clock till 6. We read in Psalm 57, Awake my soul, awake harp, I will awaken the dawn. David had learned, though he didn't quite see how things were going to happen, how things were going to come through. He knew if he just plugged into something else other than what he saw in front of him, he would see the goodness of the Lord. You see, we see the words wait for the Lord, don't we? And we think it's passive. But in the Hebrew, it actually means anticipation. Wait expectantly. So what I want to say to someone here, it might just be one person who's walked through this church today. You're facing an awful situation. You're trying to fix your focus. You're trying to change your devotion. You're trying to do all sorts of things. But what I would suggest to you today is rather than just let fear manipulate you and paralyze you and freeze you, what I would suggest you do is you would plug in to a different source. You see, when fear and when the enemy comes up against you, you don't have to listen to it. You can put something else over and cover your soul. And when you cover your soul, you plug yourself in to the word of God and you'll be able to say, I will still see the goodness of the Lord. Even though I don't quite see what's going on, I will see the goodness of the Lord. And though the malicious accusations come, although David was tired, although David was scared, something happened within his soul that made him see that fear wasn't the only option, but faith was. That we're not going to let fear evaporate, but faith is going to evict fear because of who God is. And there's someone here today, and God wants to throw the fear that you face, the what if scenarios that are perpetually going around in your head, and he's asking you to give them to him today, to let them go and to leave here free, knowing that his presence goes before you and his presence is with you. In Jesus' name, amen.